It's been a year, probably time to follow up on a promise. Here is where I finally give you my super much big, greatly anticipated thoughts on the most premium Sony soundbar setup. You guessed it, the 500 watt HTA7000 soundbar throupled with the 300 watt SASW5 submodule and the 180 watt SARS5 360 spatial sound mapping rear speakers. Hey, what's up everybody? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. In my last A7000 video published late January, 2022, I tested the A7000 with the 100 watt SARS3S rears. They were the top option at the time that still do not support Sony's 360 spatial sound mapping technology. The RS5Ss, the missing key, golden ticket, six element, the thing that can elevate the A7000 system into the spatial sound mapping ecosystem, That's multi -pass. were announced while preparing last year's review and were released a few months later in April 2022. Anyway, as exciting as bringing in the RS5s is, to make this updated review even more satisfying, I will be comparing the enhanced A7000 setup to Sony's co-flagship consumer -y home theater offering, the HTA9, which is quite different and presents you with perhaps a head scratcher of a buying choice, in particular, if your heart is set on Sony. I'll try to help out with that. Because I'm not completely crazy, both Sony setups will share my one SASW5, and they'll be polite about it, sharing is caring. And because I'm dedicated to elevating this channel from subterranean to merely embarrassing when your mom talks about it, I'll be bringing back the mighty Samsung Q990B, which I have previously hinted as being the best sounding soundbar system you can buy, at least in early 2023. Now, I can already feel the warmth radiating from your red faces. The heat map reads something like, You fool! The Ambio Jumbotron Maximus Prime is the best soundbar sound money can buy. Okay, perhaps, if, comparing just bar v bar, but that is not what this game is. The best sound package, in my extremely consequential opinion, is a combination of perceived sound integrity along with spatial realism. Maybe in the perfect lab-created room, the Ambio Max could put forth an impressive spatial game, but very few have that listening space. And sticking to the same fictional room, the other soundbar systems would similarly benefit. So, to contend for my very famous and prestigious top soundbar system-ish spot, you will need dedicated front and rear speakers along with a dedicated sub. I'm not convinced I'm wrong. And let's remember that I have reviewed the Ambio Max back when it was called just the Ambio twice. So it's not as though I'm against reviewing it or its little brother, though I have not gotten to him quite yet. All right, where is Bose? I've reviewed the 900 and I've reviewed the 700 full setup. Really beautiful design gives me the techie visual butterflies. If I was forced to place just the bar sound, I'd entertain arguments that it's better than the arc. Perhaps mostly so in music. But for cinema, I find it a bit anemic relative to the heavy hitters and the rear offerings as impressive and expensive as they may be per cubic centimeter. Well, they're just not serious enough to be considered a contender in the top tier soundbar-ish home theater space. The full Bose system I sense falls below the ARC system that I very recently ranked last on cinema sound in a four system comparison. Okay, so I probably just made a lot of unnecessary enemies as there is a fair bit of national pride tied to Bose, but at least you know where I stand. All right, the A7000 build. It's a stylish looking bar cobbled together with a mixture of fabric, glass, and metal. Bar controls, all capacitive, are located on the top left of the bar and include a power, input, Bluetooth, music service, and volume buttons. The ports are in the back and include eARC, two HDMI inputs, an aux in, good for you Sony, optical, which is treated as the same input as eARC, so intended for your TV, not CD player, and an S-Center out that allows you to use a compatible Sony TV 
as a dedicated center dialog channel. The bar is advertised as a 7.1.2 channel system, so Sony feels confident enough to advertise this as an all-in-one bar. I don't think such a thing exists, but we can play along. In traditional terms, this bar is an unusual 3.1-ish, very ishy-ishy, dot two channel system. The center channel is a tweeter sitting between two large rectangular woofers, which constitute the generously termed integrated subwoofer. A beam tweeter is powered by a single tweeter, but is filtered through a grill that disperses the tweeter sound and assists in making the sound stage wider. There are no drivers on the side of the bar, so the beam tweeter is meant to fill in that void to some degree. The two upward firing drivers are traditional woofers. The base module, the SASW5, has a forward driver and a downward firing passive radiator. It's covered in a thin acoustic cloth in the front and back. And the rest is, let's just go with alligator. The surrounds, the SARS5. Well, think mini A9 speakers, though a different color and dressed to look like it belongs in the same room with the A-series Sony soundbars. Calling it mini though is a little ironic as I think they are the biggest rear speaker offerings for a soundbar system save I suppose the Sonos 5s and, well, not going to officially count the IKEA frames. Given its roundish shape, the 360 spatial sound mapping labels, and verbiage like omnidirectional, your immediate expectation is forgivably that this is a 360 omnidirectional speaker that fires in all directions. Well, straw man, you're wrong. Again, it's a mini A9 speaker, so a 1.0.1 speaker, though having a woofer and tweeter for the ear level channel, an upward firing driver, and two passive radiators definitely makes these speakers, at the very least, appear promising, in particular when compared to the SARS-3S's. So let's back up to the 360 spatial sound mapping thing. Yes, these speakers are of particular interest, not just because they are beefier, but also, that they bring your A7000 setup into compliance for 360 spatial sound, which is aimed not so much at making the system at most DTSX compliant per se, as the bar alone is certified on both those codecs, but rather energizing, Sony would probably say revolutionizing, the realism of the 3D audio delivery. The RS5s, along with having upward firing drivers and a richer driver set, are able to communicate with the bar so that the component's relative positions can be estimated, leading to, and these are Sony's talking points, the emergence of multiple, I count 11, but let's not nitpick cartoons too much, phantom speakers that trick you into hearing sound effects up, down, left, right, front, back, where real speakers are not. So the RS5s bring updated hardware and software to unlock these enhanced capabilities. Yes, you heard right. The RS5s do have a built-in battery, which gives you the option to unplug if you believe there's an ideal position that is not close to a power source. Sony advertises 10 hours of playback. So I mostly tested with the surrounds plugged in on the off chance that there might be a minor difference in sound. So I don't have the 10 full hour unplugged experience to dispute the claim, but I did try to get a sense of the battery drain speed. So after about 45 minutes of music and a two and a half hour movie, all three battery indicator lights remained illuminated. So at the very least, you can get through a hefty movie and it seems like a lot more than that. I have not discovered a way to check the battery level apart from the three LED indicator in the front of the speaker. More options to check precise battery levels are sorely missing. Perhaps of relevance, when these speakers were unplugged, I noticed I had to turn them on manually as they turn off completely very quickly, if not in use to preserve power. So a little extra hassle before your movie of which you should be aware. Next to the power button is a dedicated optimize button that helps you to quickly re-optimize the system as you move the speakers to different locations. The RS5s are satisfying in look, feel, and driver count. The battery function is handy for sure, but can they deliver something special amongst other flagship offerings? 
One hopes. I root for all these products. Okay, the Q990B and A9 build. I've reviewed them both twice and recently. So if you want to hear me hardcore ramble on the aesthetic details, links in the description. You'll be very satisfied. For what it's worth, I think the A7000 Ensemble looks the best. Okay, specs and features. Unlike the looks, I do feel some obligation to compare the three. Refresh your memory as an inclusion or omission of any particular feature may be the purchase green light or deal breaker. Again, for more in-depth commentary. So what do these systems have in common? eARC, at least one HDMI input, a full codec freight, so Dolby including TrueHD and Atmos, DTS up to DTSX, and LPCM. Wireless control with an app and a dedicated remote, Sound modes, including your artist intent mode and auto adaptive modes. Some degree of channel level control. A way to have the TV join in on the sound making. And auto room calibration functionality. Where they differ. The number of HDMI inputs, so the A9 offers only one, where the Q990B and A7000 have two. Sony bests the Q990B by offering 4K 120Hz and 8K pass-through, where the Q990B offers a pedestrian 4K 60Hz. The Q990B does unofficially support Dolby Vision and officially HDR10+, where Sony officially supports Dolby Vision and officially supports only up to HDR10. So the Q990B kind of practically wins HDR. Only the Q990B offers a manual EQ controls, which range between two and seven bands, depending on your sound mode. Sony offers Chromecast and Google Assistant in all regions, and Samsung only in selected regions, not including the US. Do you enjoy yelling at the bar directly? Only the Q990B has a built-in microphone for voice assistance. Alexa, play music. Sure. The two Sony systems offer high res over Bluetooth with its LDAC technology. iOS devices do not support LDAC. Sony also offers an on-screen system interface that has the looks for radio, but nonetheless is decidedly convenient for setup, calibrating, updating, monitoring volume and channel levels, and codec information. Okay, why not? The sound. Let's start with the A7000 setup. Movies. Hmm. This is the second time around, and I was less impressed with the bar, but not surprisingly more impressed with the rears. Don't get me wrong. Right away, you get the sense that Sony is technically proficient in delivering sharp, cutting, clear sounds. You know that you are listening to something very modern, especially when coupled with not so very subtle soundtracks like Transformers. Anyway, for whatever reason, the bar, even with very special surrounds, failed to capture my fancy. I wasn't compelled to stand up and pound on my chest, which I assume is standard sound approval signaling. While the ensemble can get plenty loud, in particular with data-rich codecs like Dolby True HD, the sound just came across as flat, stringy, something less than full-bodied. I also didn't sense that the soundbar and rear speakers gelled enough. This is true with all soundbar systems to a certain extent, but I commonly had this uneasy sensation that I was listening to two performances, the soundbar and the rears. The soundbar does a perfectly acceptable job in kind of leading the sound. Dialogue is clear, effects are agile, etc. But the front sound was too constrained by the bar dimensions. Perhaps it's my listening space, but I just wasn't getting that convincing wider than the bar front soundstage. The rears, the RS5s, sounded impressive, clear and crisp, and presented really convincing side-to-side -side directional effects. Decepticons whipping their tail around and such, but the play between the rears and front typically didn't image well. 
I couldn't grab on to a sustained coherence, which kind of surprised me as I thought they would output a fairly tight performance with all the spatial mapping and whatever. Something closer to the performance of the A9 than what I was hearing. It could very well be that speakers like the RS5s were always tuned to play nice with something like two other RS5s in the front. So the A9. Despite my gripes, the RS5s are clearly a better option than the RS3Ss. Go all the way with the system if you're set on the A7000. Base performance. I appreciate the Sony base module for being a solid team player. It blends well in such a way that it sounds like an extension of the bar range rather than a separate module. Stepping out of super critical mode, let's put things into perspective, the sound is not some sort of super huge fail. If I allowed myself to just kind of enjoy the dang movie and stop trying to be soundbar Dan for a second, I certainly found myself engrossed in the movie as were all my co-watchers. I also want to call out, I am judging this system largely relative to the most impressive soundbar systems-ish to ever exist. If you're coming from, let's say, a mid-range soundbar or TV sound, you're going to encounter an undeniably enhanced experience with this system, just perhaps not as enhanced as other options. Music. The delivery can be quite fun. The two little subby drivers in the center channel generate surprisingly deep and contoured thumps, most noticeable in hip hop and rap tracks. So The Weeknd, Drake, Miguel, Jack Harlow, certain kinds of pop songs, The Beebs, Bad Bunny. <laughs> so there is certainly a genre space that is flattering to this system. More natural, less affected songs didn't seem particularly special largely because I generally don't find the Sony sound particularly enriching. Maybe I'm on an island, but I sense Sony generally tuned systems to stimulate, maybe not so much to nurture. I sense more modern music is more about the former. This system is not trying to be a traditional stereo setup, so hard to knock it for not replicating that kind of vibe. Nonetheless, I do appreciate when a soundbar system can bring some of that warmth to my music, and I'm just not getting that here. Next, the Q990B, movies. Bottom line, I would take the Q990B eight days out of the week over the A7000 setup I'm reviewing here if we're just talking sound. Spoiler alert. How do those work? Quite frankly, it should be at least a little surprising if this were not true, right? First of all, Samsung's sound fundamentals are pretty solid. I suppose some might disagree with me, but probably most are on my team. Whatever, I don't really care. So solid fundamentals proliferated by an unchecked battery of channels, 16 of them, and drivers, 22 of them. So we got, in the context of a soundbar system, quality and quantity, where Sony, as well-designed as any one of their drivers may be, it's a 5.1.4 10-channel system if you buy all the expensive extra stuff. So the Q990B is offering over twice as many ear-level channels as the A7000 setup here to fill out the sound. So while the Q990B is also soundbar-centric in the final analysis, the front and rear ensemble did seem more coordinated than the 7000, which is a feat I suppose, as there are so many different angles at which the system is firing and seems like a recipe for chaos. Luckily, that didn't manifest. The Q990B hit harder, and I was more frequently hearing things happening in places where speakers were not, whether a plasma cannon or a crunchy footstep. Far off to the sides of me, above me, right in front of me, well beyond the physical dimensions of the speakers. These are the kinds of cool effects you are paying for. I also heard more detail or discovered little details that I missed when listening with the A7000. So the rears. While it would be fun to outline more distinctions, I really didn't sense that the RS5s were some sort of a runaway winner. It could be that the speakers themselves could produce 
lower tones with the passive radiators or crisper highs with the two tweeters, but it was not obviously elevating the whole of the experience more than the Q990B rears. Coordination may be more important than perhaps marginal sound quality difference of any one driver. Anyway, the 360 spatial mapping rears in conjunction with the A7000 did not synthesize enough movie magic to dethrone the Q990B, and I'm afraid it wasn't all that close. Music, when comparing to the A7000, there were some tracks where the Q990B sounded less contoured from the bar and perhaps the 60 to 90 hertz range, highlighting the benefit of the A7000 subwoofer on certain bass-driven tracks like Gasoline and Sacrifice from The Weeknd, and generally hip-hop poppy songs that I referenced earlier. Though the Q990B soundbar sounded like it was operating in the same frequency ranges. That is, if the A7000 has an integrated sub, well, the Q990B sounds like it has one too. The Q990B can heat up the tweeters a bit and give off a healthy layering of fizz, atmosphere, carbonation to the sound that I've heard is unpleasant for some of my listeners. I think it's fair that some of these audio choices is a step away from natural and could therefore be deemed as off-putting. Though, I tend to think it's a feature of the bar that makes it competent in a wide range of genres, as some tracks are just meant to be punchy with a fair bit of low bass balanced by tweeter-heavy rhythmic schemes from drum machines. Those older, more time-tested tracks, let's say The Traveling Wilburys, End of the Line, Frank Sinatra, My Way, held up admirably and at times beautifully on the system, as the mids are not particularly lean, and performances are allowed to be full-bodied and, dare I say, luxuriant in a manner that the 7000 cannot or does not. The A9. Third time talking about this in two months, so I don't know. Subscribe again. At this point, I think it's a moral imperative to point out this system has been the stickiest system I have dealt with, meaning from lots of choices, including the A7000, Q990B, Clips 1200, ARC, Bose, JBL, I continue to go back to the A9 for personal use in my home theater back there, which is 98% big budget movies. This might seem strange as I have placed the Q990B sound performance above the A9 in previous assessments, and well, I'm technically holding to that. I think the Q990B sounds better in that, like I mentioned, it just sounds more lush and full-bodied than the Sony sound. But the A9 just continues to offer something new that with every viewing just continues to reinforce that this revolutionary strategy is not a gimmick. More than any other system, I'm curious, enthusiastic to rediscover, experience anew, my Blu-ray catalog, Mad Max, The Revenant, Rogue One, Blade Runner 2049. This may sound a little saccharine, but the A9 has fostered a bit of a return to innocence, showing I have the capacity to still be amazed. Anyway, why is this system so refreshing and delightful? It's freer, less constipated, bottlenecked, more open, less centralized. It's not a tweak or even a substantial build on the same idea. From my perspective, it's a categorically different kind of audio experience. I think there is magic to be extracted from these 360 spatial sound mapping speakers, but like I hinted at, that magic seems to be unlocked when you get four or more of them working together. The sound bubble is not perfect, and let's maybe stay a little skeptical about the 12 Phantom speakers, or at least as skeptical as they can create an impenetrable electromagnetic shield. But the soundscape is much more balanced in resolution and decidedly more continuous than the Q990B and more so the 7000. Even in the more subtle dialogue scenes, you feel more immersed in the atmosphere and subject to its unique tactility. The dialogue emerges from the screen and is closer to the actor's mouth. Reading other reviews, I've heard some wording like the dialogue is a little recessed, so maybe you want to move the front speakers closer together. I don't endorse those opinions. Don't do that. Keep the speakers spread apart. This system wants to be big. Don't push the walls in. 
Bottom line, the A9 feels the most like going to the movies and the most like stepping into a fantasy world. Music. I continue to struggle on how to conceptualize music playback as I'm kind of less settled on it than I am about cinema performance. So, as I've mentioned in previous reviews, there are tracks or genres that just sparkle and even have a unique kind of experiential participatory element to them, mainly modern hip-hop and in particular when presented in Dolby Atmos form. In general, these modern tracks are more beckoning than rock, where again, traditional 90s rock just lands flat. I'm having a hard time explaining why, but one theory is that this system is just overemphasizing the coarser parts of the sound that should not be emphasized. Classic rock from the 70s, 80s holds up better. Anyway, I kind of want to say that the A9 is a really good demo system that, with the right tracks and codecs, arguably have the highest highs of the three systems. As listening to music in Atmos on a very competent Atmos machine is unique and evokes perhaps the strongest autonomic nervous system response as the sound is just a little surprising. Nonetheless, I find myself listening to music with the A9 in relatively small doses as I find it the most fatiguing of the three. So yes, pretty hot and bothered by the A9 for movies, more confused when it comes to music. Always one to undermine myself, I should point out that I have not really found anyone I can point to that agrees with me on my music opinion here, so maybe I'm stretching. The reaction to music playback does seem kind of overwhelmingly positive from the reviews I've seen. So, you know, look around, read around. Maybe I'll have to revisit in a few months. All right, per usual, this video is well longer than I wanted it to be, so let's wrap this up in something like a package. As is obvious from my review, the RS5s did not result in a system that bested the A9 nor Q990B in sound. Rather, it presented something like a generously spaced third option of the three. I did have somewhat modest expectations for the A7000, but was expecting there to be a bit more magic and perhaps more conflicting feelings about the A7000 performance relative to the Q990B and A9. While I think the Q990B continues to be the sound king, it has become pretty clear over the last two months that the uniqueness of the A9 in cinema and its reshaping of the 3D soundscape has won me over. In terms of what I most want to listen to, does this preference have a firm grounding in audiophile fundamentals? Maybe not, but at some point you prefer what you choose to spend the most time with, and proof here is in the listening hours. Anyway, thanks for watching. Catch you on the next one.